time for a little one up, one down, and I had to pull out my uh, blocker charge shirt for this one because check it out. He was once King Rex of Lexington, and now he's, of course, King Rex of social media. Rex Chapman, I am so excited to talk to you today because our paths have crossed so many times in terms of basketball, but this is the first time that we're really kind of having a conversation one on one, so thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I've watched you for years, and yes, I'm sure we've said hi in passing several times, but over the past few months, we've become Twitter buddies, so that's really cool, right? We have become Twitter buddies, and I, I do want to give you a lot of credit for what you're doing for COVID-19, raising the money. Where does that stand right now? You know, we have over 2,500 donations. It's been going for a little over three weeks. Uh, partnered my opioid foundation with um, a COVID relief fund and we raised a little almost $200,000. We've given out almost $100,000 to places in Kentucky, places in New York, and we're trying to hit, you know, other hot spots in the country. But uh, people just donating. It's been fantastic. I, I'm heartened and uh, yeah, just just wonderful stuff. Yeah, how much does that fill your cup? I mean, you get a lot of attention with the social media stuff, but when you're really kind of able to give back, what's that like for you? Well, it's great just no, right now, just knowing that, I mean, people are really hurting, you know, and we're giving to food banks and uh, first responders trying to get more PPE and stuff like that. So that part of it feels nice. But on a personal, on a personal note, you know, I, I've been through my struggles and um, my kids, you know, I, I'm trying to do diff things differently now. I've got four kids between 27 and 19 and, you know, I embarrassed them a little bit and back in the day and I wasn't my best I was taking painkillers for a long time so I'm trying to do things differently and I'm hoping that some of the things I, I I do these days make them proud does it make you does it make you feel better like kind of the things that you're doing and, and moving in the right direction and not just making your kids proud I mean gosh your influence mm -hmm. right now is, is so vast it does make me it does make me feel feel nice but also you know battle depression and some you know stuff since i was a teenager so and right now we're in a world where it's you can't be around people i'm a swimmer that's really what i do uh to stay in shape i can't swim now i haven't swam in well six weeks or more and uh, um you know that for me <laughs> that kind of keeps me sane so uh, i'm a way to get away from my phone every day, all that stuff. Um, so I'm doing other things. I'm trying to walk, which is tougher on this old body of mine. So we're all out of our routine. This Twitter and the social media stuff and the COVID relief fund, it's definitely helping me, helping me, helping me pass time and keep my mind occupied and just trying to do, do the next right thing. Yeah, see, I didn't know you were a swimmer. I want to talk about that. Yeah. I, I grew up swimming, and now I do triathlons. So are you, like, strictly pool? Are you open water? Like, what are you doing? I'm strictly pool. I grew up, I was, yeah, I, um, first sport I did, uh, my parents put me in on swim team when I was five, and I got the competition bug like nobody's business, you know, had to be first to touch, had to be first to touch, and that really fueled me as a young person, plus, I'm swimming hundreds of laps each day and I don't care. It's fun. You don't, you don't even get tired when you're a kid. Um, so I kept swimming all the way through. I stopped though, when I start, started playing basketball seriously. And uh, I just, I, when I got out of rehab five years ago, I had to lose a bunch of weight. I was probably 260 or 270 and I never played more than 185 pounds. So I started swimming again, gradually, gradually. Now I do it six or seven days a week. And uh, yeah, I feel like it just keeps me sane and my body feels great from it, but I can't do it right now. So, you know, that's, that's stressful. Are you one of those guys? Cause I know, I know when I get to the pool, I swam my whole life, but when I get to the pool, that moment before I dive in the water, I'm like, why am I doing this? I, I know. Do this. <laughs> is that the worst? I know. <laughs> no, it is. It is. But it, it kind of reminds me of basketball back in the day when, you know, I was getting older. It wasn't quite as fun anymore. You know, I was, you know, hurt a lot. And I remember getting to the gym and thinking, OK, I just got to get that sweat. As soon as I get that first sweat, I'm good to go. And that's how I get with the pool. I dread it. I dread it. It's going to be cold. It's going to be cold. The second I go into the water, I go, all right, worst part's over. Let's do this. <laughs> I'm committed. Now I'm committed. Yeah. 
You have right. to do some open water swims. I have I, friends that actually like swam the Alcatraz swim before and like been bumped by seals and oh, wow. there are sharks out there. So, well, I, and that's a little extreme, obviously. Yeah, but, but I, I, would, I would love to do it. I, I'm a pretty strong swimmer. I can't do any of that other stuff because I can't run anymore. Though. Yeah. I can't run at all. I, I don't even try to run. That's pathetic, but. <laughs> Maybe we can get together and do a relay of some sort. There we go. Part of I, that. I'm, a swim, I'm a swimmer. I'll do that. So we not only have Kentucky basketball and now swimming in common, but Charlotte as well. Oh, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I actually worked for the uh, Bobcats when they first became the Bobcats. And, and obviously you were part of the very <laughs> first uh, year. Do you still keep in touch with folks here in Charlotte? Oh, yeah. Dale Curry. Dale's one of my best friends. Muggsy, Bogues. Uh, we, we talk and text every week still. Um, yeah, I'm thinking back. One of my first weekends in, in, in Charlotte as a 19-year-old, I had a meeting there. Because someone was, oh, it was Hannah Storm. Remember Hannah? Oh, you know yeah. Hannah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hannah, Hannah was young. She was working in Charlotte at one of the stations. And I had a meeting. It was kind of a business meeting. And I'm straight out of classes. And I sat in there and pretended to be an adult for about an hour with Hannah Storm and uh, a couple of executives from the team. And I, I thought about that. She brought that up not long ago on Twitter. And I said, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. So time just flies. Gosh, it's been 35 years ago, maybe. Yeah, Charlotte's a lot different now. It is. Charlotte is beautiful. I love it. Um, got all the lakes around there, and it's just a really good city. Plus, when I was there, you know, you didn't have, you didn't have football. There was nothing. Right. Up, nothing. I was going to say downtown. Nothing uptown. Um, you had the right? triangle, right? You had you had college basketball. Right. That was about it. That was it. Now, it was yeah. a it, it was a college basketball town. The Hornets came to town and. All what was fascinating, I found, was that you know, in Kentucky, it's mostly Kentucky fans, UK fans, little pocket of Louisville fans in Louisville. In the Carolinas, man, you got UNC, Duke, NC State, Wake, South Carolina, on and on and on, and the allegiances are split. But when the Hornets came in there, all of those people came together to be Hornets fans, and that was really beautiful. You brought up Louisville, so or Louisville. Louisville. You, you almost went there, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that was my game before. What's that rival? What was that like for you when you played in that rivalry? Then it was weird because uh, I had committed to Louisville really uh, to Denny Crum as a as a junior verbally, and I loved, they were my dream school. Uh, Daryl Griffith, my all time idol, um, and they started recruiting me first, and so I was I felt like I had a, a loyalty to them. And then I visited both schools. My grandmother lived in Lexington. Um, and really at the time, the UK prog program after the visits seemed like a varsity program compared to a JV program. And when I say that, I say it with all due respect, just facilities. It was just all the things that shouldn't have mattered did to an 18 year old. Oh, yeah. So then I, you know, and I don't regret it at all. I came to Kentucky. We were, we had, I had two really fun years here, but play, we played those guys twice and we beat them twice. And the first time we embarrassed them and it was at their place. It was probably my fifth or sixth college game. And I, I torched them pretty good. And I just remember, you know, our fans were elated. Our coaches were, I was, but I was also upset for my friends, Kenny Payne, Purvis Ellison and, and Coach Hall and Allen Houston's dad, Wade was on that staff. I felt really bad for those guys. And the great part about all of that is the next summer, Danny Crum, between my freshman and sophomore year, Danny Crum, the coach of the Louisville Cardinals, was coaching the USA team. I went and tried out for the USA team. He picked me. I started, played all the minutes with Danny Manning and David Robinson. He still loved me after all of that. And uh, to this day, I, I consider Danny Crum one of my favorite people and one of my favorite coaches ever. Isn't that what those rivalries are all about, though? Louisville, yeah. you know, Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke. It, it's a fierce rivalry, but it's one built on so much respect because of how the programs are. It really is. And, you know, I think the one thing you find is that, like, Duke, Carolina, you know, all those guys, they get their hair cut at the same place, uh -huh. you know. So they're in the barber shops together. Um, much the same here. Every bit of local news that you see about Kentucky or, or Louisville, you know, they're watching in Louisville. We're watching in, in Lexington. So you know each other inside and out, really. But you're young players, and you, you just 
what I found is that it's way, way, way more intense and passionate. The fans are, yeah. the players are there and yeah, we're into it, but the fans are really into it. Oh yeah. I do want to ask you um, about the Michael Jordan documentary. Did, did you yeah. watch that? I know I've seen some stuff on social um, about like you, you playing defense on him and yeah. him not having the ball in his hand when you were playing defense on him. What'd you think of the documentary? I think it's fantastic. I could watch it, you know, every day for the rest of the year. Um, can't wait till next weekend. <sighs> Michael's so different, man. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of me on posters during the next few weeks of, of trying to guard Michael. But um, I was thinking, but he was just so different. And when people, I thought Bobby Knight said something really interesting last night on the documentary. He said, Michael's one of the strongest basketball players he's ever, ever seen. And he really was. Those hands of his, quick story we're 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 bowling one night in chicago a night before i'm gonna we're gonna play the bulls the next night i'm in charlotte or washington it was me and michael and three or four other friends of ours and we're bowling and you know how sometimes the pins will get stuck in the bowling lane you got to roll another ball down the aisle or down the lane to reset well michael's telling us the story and we're all facing the bowling pins and we just kind of alert him hey the pins are stuck he reached over, backhanded, grabbed a 17-pound bowling ball, not by the holes, like it was a grapefruit, and flung it backhanded down the lane. And I sort of looked at all the other guys, and they went, sort of gave me the, yeah, he can do that. And I'm sitting there going, I got to play against him tomorrow night. You know, his hands are ginormous. It was so intimidating, some of the stuff he did without trying to be intimidated. Did he give you like that little wink when he did that? You know, that wink he gave on the court, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. He, you know, the, uh, the other thing, someone just asked me, we got, he and I got into it one night in, in Miami, just a little thing. It was nothing really, but it kind of got blown up. It's got me jawing at him and him jawing back at me. People are always ask me, what did you say to him? What were you saying to him? And I always say, yeah, you let me know how that whole shoe brand thing goes in 30 years hair that you <laughs> that's not what i said <laughs> yeah let's see if that sticks air jordan <laughs> no he he uh i bumped in a little hard he didn't realize it was me and then i turned around and said oh i'm just supposed to let you dunk it get the crowd in the game they'll be cheering for you guys and he goes all right all right <laughs> That's I I worked with Brad Doherty for a while and used to tell Jordan stories a lot and they're just you just you're listening to a part of history which is so incredible. And I'll I'll tell you this one of one of my favorite MJ stories too. I we beat them in Miami and I had a really big game got 38 or 39. They came in the, the year that they were good really uh, 172. We, we beat them and uh, at our place and then they swept us 3-0 in the first round of the playoffs but i we beat them and played them in the regular season about two weeks later in our building again and michael and i at this point we'd known each other for for a good decade uh since i was in high school he called me for dean smith to go to carolina uh, when i was in high school and he was just in chicago so we go back that far he's um we beat him i had a big game and then we played him two weeks later in our place and same agent we 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 know each other know each other and they throw the ball up and we're you know on the jump circle he and i together they throw the ball up and as soon as the ball left the referee's hands he cracked me with an elbow right in the sternum caught, caught me right in the breastbone and i kind of punched over and went and then i went oh, okay it's gonna be like this tonight <laughs> and it was he got like 40 and didn't play in the fourth quarter. And I got like 16 on three for 13 or something like that. But just to tell you, we're friends. He's my guy. Love him to death. Out there, he was out to get you every single night. And as a competitor, I loved that. I love You want to go out there. The other thing, you better be on your A game when you play against him because he can embarrass you. I mean, he was that good. And NBA players don't like saying that about anybody. Yeah, to be the best, you got to beat the best, right? Are you texting yeah. him like during the documentary? No, no, I'm giving him space. I was texting Buzz Peterson though last night, his his roomie at, at Caroline. I'm just, I'm so proud of Michael. Yeah, I know that might sound weird. I, you saw that, you saw his interviews from high school. You yeah. saw him from college. See how far he's come. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as a person, 
as a person being able to you know now he's charismatic he's all that but he's he's had to grow man and you know it's not like it's not like going to being some kind of famous back in the 80s 90s people that don't remember there were there were about only two people in the world that they couldn't go anywhere. You'd have to, if they wanted to go to the mall, they'd shut the mall down so they could go in two, two people, Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan. If he wanted to go shopping with his wife, you know, in anywhere in Chicago, they would shut the, shut the store down. So Michael and his wife could come in. I mean, learning to live with that sort of celebrity is, is pretty, pretty amazing. And, you know, I mean, you're living in the social media realm right now. Imagine if that was around back in the day, like when you were in high school or college or yeah. the pros, it, it's such a different world nowadays. It is. And I, I think back, you know, I was, I was pretty, yeah, I, I think if I'd have been in college back then, it might've been a little bit like Johnny Manziel, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I would have handled it any better, really. Um, that's just a lot of, a lot to put on a young person. Um, and I thought it was brilliant what his parents said what his mom said about sending him to Carolina. He wanted him, they wanted him to go there to raise him, not just to be a, a better basketball player, but to be a good person yeah. and to learn. And the one thing that I think wasn't magnified enough last night is that Michael Jordan, are the, maybe the greatest player in the world, he went to college for three years and he was taught the game. He was taught the game by one of the finest teachers of the game in in history dean smith roy williams on the sidelines he was taught he also came in and he wasn't the big man on campus he had to play behind sam perkins and james worthy and 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 figure it out and those years in college of being taught the game translated forever because he's one of the few guys i, I was athletic and most athletic people take take short shut shortcuts Michael didn't take shortcuts. Kobe didn't take shortcuts. And when you're the best and you don't take shortcuts, that's what you get, those guys. You become the greatest of all time. Right. What, what's the thing that people want to talk to you most about nowadays, Rex? Because I feel like, you know, the documentary did a really good job of, of yeah. talking about all your different lives. And we could sit here and talk about your NBA career all day mm -hmm. long. I love those stories. But there's so many different, there's so many different levels. What is the one thing people want to talk to you about most? You know, I don't know. I, I think probably, uh, probably the opioids, the the painkillers, and you know, the, uh, in Kentucky, it's just ravaged the state. It continues to ravage the state. You know, we learn we lose about 130 people per day in America to uh, opioids, and whether that's painkillers or heroin or whatever your your thing is, we do. Um, and I, I don't go anywhere that I, A, don't either see people that are on them because at this point I can kind of tell or family members of people who desperately are looking for some, some kind of guidance and help to help their loved one. So, you know, and I try to speak on those things as much as I can and, and help out because I know it, it does, when I was going through it, I think back to four or five people from Rick Pitino to Kenny Payne to my son to the th people who said things to me in that moment of despair and just being down. Like I remember thinking I'm toxic. Nobody will ever want to talk to me again. I'll never work again. I'll never do anything. But there were things that people said to me that got me through. And I know how that is when you're sitting there, you're trying to grasp and grab anything, a life, life preserver. And you, you hang on to things that people say. So I, I think that's probably the thing that people want to talk the most about, just knowing that there, you can get out of it, but it's hard. It it's hard. really hard. It is hard. And I'm sure that family members um, appreciate yeah. talking to you as well, because they're the ones that, that, that are helpless in, in, in the situation when they have they're, a loved one dealing with that. You're, you're right. And the other part, the flip side, that is those, those family members, we as addicts, a lot of times we treat them the worst. Um, we will isolate, not talk to them, or when we do, the reason is because they know us the best and they know something is wrong with us. Mm -hmm. So they, and so it ends up happening. There's a whole thing and it, that you got to try to get through. Addicts become really good liars. 
and we we hide what we're doing. And the one thing I learned most from, I think, from my last stint was, hey, secrets are not good for me. Hmm. They're just not good for me. And so I try to, you know, if I got something going on, I try to tell somebody uh, to let them know that, you know, I, I need a little help right now. So, yeah, that's the that's the biggest thing. And I think probably the thing that, you know, and, and that does help me. It helps me to uh, keep doing the right thing, too. Well, I mean, I've told you before, I've reached out to you on the side uh, and mm-hmm. told you, you know, a situation and, and um, yep. it's not easy and, and super no. proud of you. I'm so happy that you found what you found on social media. Thanks. How much do you have to censor yourself on the social media stuff? How much do you wonder if when you hit that send button, if people are going to get the wrong idea about that specific video? Because I think we all do it, right? Or yeah, you, like, all we all do. We all do. Yeah. And there's, there's, there are definitely ones that I've put out that I've gone, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. And I'll delete it real fast or something. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I, there's a fine line between, you know, being entertaining and being offensive and you gotta, you've got to walk that line, but I, I try to do a, a decent job of it. Do you go through waves where like one week you're all about the dogs yep. and the next week it's all about babies and then, yeah, and I'll, f- I'll feel like I get into a rut, too. I'll be like, all right, and then I'll go, all right, well, I've only shown 17 dog videos in a row. Let me mix it up a little bit. <laughs> I can go down the rabbit hole pretty fast. Do you have, I mean, I know you can't pick a favorite one, right? I mean, but do you have one. I remember the guy, did he get electrocuted? He sat in that, like, electric chair oh, yeah. at the fun house. <laughs> so hilarious. I, I promise that one a few, a few weeks ago, uh, the little girl, pretending to like her mom's cooking hilarious and I, I i bet i watched it a 150 <laughs> times there you know everything from the from her just almost puking to the mom trying to keep her from puking by going oh okay <laughs> and then to the end when she goes i'm okay <laughs> it's just all so great so silly we all need to laugh Time time. I can imagine doing your show must be so therapeutic oh. and so much fun for you because you just sit there and laugh the whole time. We do. And the, the, the best part about that is the buddy of mine who, who I do it with, his name's David Helmers. And uh, we actually went to preschool together. Oh, and wow. and he, he, he's a lawyer. He went to grade school, middle school, high school, all of that together. And so his buddy, one of his good buddies is actually one of the longtime producers at Adult Swim. So that's kind of how all this came to, came about. He's never, he had never been on her before and he's great. He's great, <laughs> just a natural, but it is very therapeutic. We have fun. We laugh for an hour or two every Thursday. Um, we do it live. Yeah, it's, life is weird, right? It is weird. It is weird. Um, rapid fire questions before I let you go. How many pairs of sneakers do you own, Rex? 200. Oh my gosh. How many Air Jordans do you I guess that's a big question now, right? <laughs> Not many, because really and truly back in the day, you didn't wear another person's shoe. And obviously nobody had their own shoe, but Michael there was no way a per- that's what gets me now. I see people wearing, you know, James Harden shoes and stuff that playing against James Harden. That's weird. Anyway, now I don't mind wearing the Jordan from time to time, but yeah, I'm not the biggest Jordan guy. My son. You have a lot of shoes. You have them all in the same place, huh? No, they're scattered everywhere. I'm like a hoarder. <laughs> okay. So what's the craziest thing a UK fan ever did when you were in college? Mm. That I can tell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my goodness. Uh, I, I got, I'm drawing a blank. I don't know. Uh, we'll save it for later then if you can. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, one thing that you haven't done before during that you're doing right now during this time of social distancing. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to read a lot. I'm trying to read a lot more on what we have going on health wise. Yeah. I read a great article today in the uh, Louisville Courier Journal about the coronavirus and about, um, you know, a, a high school basketball tournament in Indiana uh, in the middle of March uh, that, you know, people are passing away from now and people are really infected. So I'm trying to read. I'm not a voracious reader by any means but i'm i'm i am trying to stay on top of all of this and and 
hopefully help educate myself and maybe a few of my loved ones around me. Rex, you inspire so many. Your story and your strength and now what you're doing, making people laugh on social media. So I'm so happy we had a chance to kind of sit down and talk to each other. Uh, hopefully this isn't the last time. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Shannon. We'll do it again anytime you want.